It is absolutely certain and without a shadow of a doubt that the papal hierarchy at Rome and its members in Britain and Ireland as well were in possession of this knowledge and that they also had a lively knowledge of the long and continuous intercourse between Ireland and the American continent or land of the West. The traditions of the intercourse never died out among the Irish. The old tradition of St. Brendan sailing to the land of the West in AD 545 from the foot of the great headland in Kerry, which bears his name, but merely a ray to shed light upon this fact. Another side note, I've been to that headland in County Kerry. Um, the Ring of Kerry, I've been there, where St. Brennan launched his small ship to cross the Atlantic way before Columbus. There is an evidence that the fact of this intercourse was a common tradition along the Atlantic coast of Europe, and it is safe to say that Rome knew of the colonizations made by the Irish on the Western continent and of the religious establishments which was there and they set up wherever they planted a colony. With due causation to the reader to make a proper allowance for the attempt of the Roman churchmen always to connect the Irish with the Roman church, we will let the Abbe Brasseur de Bourbogue speak on this point. In this note, his translation of the sacred book of the Mayas called the Popol Vuh, there is an abundance of legends and traditions concerning the passage of the Irish into America and their habitual communication with that continent may centuries, many centuries before the time of Columbus. We should bear in mind that Ireland was colonized by the Phoenicians or by the people of that race, an Irish saint named Vigil who lived in the 8th century, was accused to Pope Zachary of having taught heresies on the subject and of the antipodes. At first, he wrote to the Pope that the reply to the charge, but afterward, he went to Rome in person to justify himself, and there he proved to the Pope that the Irish had been accustomed to communicate with the transatlantic world. In view of the knowledge which we possess today, and believe which is founded upon that knowledge, it is worthwhile to consider here, if but briefly, some of the circumstances connected with the voyage of Columbus. In the accounts, be it remembered, we have been informed that he sought aid from the church fathers. He traveled about from one church establishment to another, and it is said that he went to Rome to seek aid there. However, that may be a junta composed of mostly of the church fathers in Spain. After hearing his views and beliefs, refused him assistance or approval. This opposition lasted for a number of years, but was later evidently withdrawn, as we find that it was through the influence of the father confessor of a Spanish monastery that King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella fitted out their expedition, which enabled Columbus to embark upon the voyage westward. Spain, at that time, with its king and queen, was almost completely under the church influence. We are told that Columbus's reasons for embarking on this voyage was an ardent desire to plant the standard of the cross in the new lands which he might discover and that he believed that by sailing westward we would be able to find new trade routes to the Indies. These reasons which have been given out here are spacious and may be dismissed as not being true motives. As for the desire to set up the cross, we will see that this expedition and subsequent ones under the leadership of the priests destroyed the cross wherever they found it on the Western Hemisphere. And we may also see set aside a fiction that the fitting out of the expedition to discover a new trade route to the East because the Turks or Muslims dominated the overland trade route to that part of the world. In the absence of knowledge, this latter reason has appeared plausible in order to sustain this impression as to the object of the voyage, we are told that the two commercial and trading republics of Venice and Genoa suffered most by the loss of the eastern trade route, and that they were especially clamorous for the discovery, a new route to the east. Now, if this were a fact, why did not these two states, each comprising a seafaring people equipped with fleets and eager for commerce and trade, send their fleets to the west? to trade and make discoveries after the news of Columbus' successful voyage had spread abroad. 
They were the two greatest maritime states in the Mediterranean, if not in Europe at that time. If they needed a trade route so badly, would they not have entered into competition with the other nations for that share of the trade and spoils? Instead of those two states, whom we have been told wanted it most, we find Spain, Portugal, England, France, and Holland monopolizing the trade and spoils of discovery. None of these nations were better equipped for overseas trade or voyages than Venice or Genoa, and it is rather surprising that the latter did not engage in the Western trade. If their need be so great, would not the Pope, when he assumed to divide the new world into spheres, allotting one to Spain and another to Portugal, be verily like to assign spheres respectively to those two Italian city-states? The whole thing is merely a part of the fabric of lies invented to conceal the right motive for projecting the voyage. Columbus was said to have been a Genoese, but discoveries have been made since which show that he was a Spaniard, born and bred in Spain. Thus, it is obvious that the alleged reasons for the voyage are false and will not do. They have been accepted heretofore without close examination. There was another and far more urgent reason for the voyage. But before proceeding to give the real cause back of it, let us dispose of the excuse of the Turkish or Muslim menace to the commerce between Europe and the East, which was but dust for the eyes so that men would not be able to see the real motive. There had been constant commerce carried on between the West and the East, not only during the period of time we are dealing with, but long before and since over the land and sea route from the Mediterranean through Constantinople and by devious routes eastward. The Muslims have dominated the main eastern overland route for more than 700 years. There was a partial interruption to their sway during the Crusades when the Christians held the kingdom of Jerusalem for the period of 88 years. This kingdom fell in 1187 AD and the period of the Crusades came to an end about 1285 AD. It was not the Turk who stood in the way of commerce, or to trade as such. The Crusades were brought on by Rome, who instigated the Christian nations of Europe to attack the Muslim in order that she might possess the so-called Holy Land. The Turks were forced to defend themselves and the land which had been in their hands for some centuries, but there was no unsurmountable barriers to peace if Rome had wished peace, when again the stream of commerce could have resumed its wanted flow. The Turks have never abjured trade or commerce. During the wars of the Crusades, the most frightful massacres and excesses were committed due to the Christian fanaticism. Yet, despite all this, the Muslim king Saladin of Egypt and the Greek emperor Alexius of Byzantine had no difficulty in coming to a mutual understanding in making peace between themselves and the peoples of their respective countries. But with the Roman church it was different. The Fatimite Caliphate of Egypt wanted to make peace with the Roman church cohorts and he offered to guarantee to all unarmed pilgrims an unmolested sojourn of one month in Jerusalem and to aid the crusaders on their march to the holy city if they would acknowledge his supremacy within the bounds of his Syrian empire. His proposal for peace was rejected. Rome was out for the spoils and possessions to increase her income and power. The onus belongs to Rome for whatever interpretation there was to commerce with the east, and this would have been removed at any time, we believe, if Rome had earnestly desired it. It can readily be seen that the deemed for new trade route could not have been very strong or Rome would have had to yield. So we may dismiss this reason as an invention. Moreover, if we see the new trade route was, was to be formed, why look to the West for it? We have been taught to believe through interested sources that Western oceans in the time of Columbus was believed to be an unknown and limitless waste of waters holding the most forbidding and frightful terrors and people and hideous monsters of gruesome shapes who would destroy anyone who would be venturous enough to attempt to go that far westward. After the conquest and absorption of the Irish church, such fictions may have been spread among the masses by the Roman church priests, and in the few generations they would have found a wide belief. 
If so, they served a purpose for Rome for the time being while she was consolidating her conquest in different parts and strengths and strengthening her organizations for future expansion and growth. The astute leaders of the church held no such notions regarding the Western Ocean. The mental medicine they prescribe for the multitude is something apart and always has been from what they themselves partake of. So, on that point, there is not the least room for doubt. For if they believe such silly fiction, it is only reasonable to suppose they would not have at any time favored the project and voyage of Columbus, that the voyage had another objective, that that be given out by the priests, we may well believe. The circumstances under which the voyage was promoted and aided merits a much more extended eludication that I aided merits and much more extended eludication that I am privileged from the nature of this work to give here. Let me briefly call attention to the struggle in which Ferdinand and Isabella were engaged with in the Moors and the endeavor to reclaim the kingdom of Granada. The completion of this struggle left king and queen as exhausted of all means as did crusades leave practically in all of Europe. And more especially did the fathers of the church feel the effects due to the crusades in the lost revenue from properties and privileges which they had formerly held but which were now taken over by the kings and nobility to recoup. In a measure, the losses sustained in those wars to advance the interests of the church organizations. This state of affairs had had direct bearing on the project of Columbus's voyage and on the final decision to promote it. The resources of Ferdinand and Isabella were so low that she had pledged her jewels in order to find means to furnish the necessary vessels and supplies. The war against the Moors, which reduced Spain to such an extremity, was waged in measure as much in behalf of the church to banish the infidel and reclaim the country for Christendom as it was to reign the country for the crown of Spain. The country, as consequence, was in a terrible state of poverty and the church was also financially lean. The state of affairs, coupled with the fear that owing to the persistence of Columbus in seeking aid, which might be granted, someone whom the church could not control, caused them, after due deliberation, to promote the voyage at that particular time. That the papal authorities at Rome had long possessed a pretty good knowledge of the Irish intercourse with the Western continent, we may well believe. This knowledge they obtained from the Irish priests, as stated by the Abbe Brasseur of Dubrogon. In fact, it would have been the next to impossible to have kept this knowledge from them, as Ireland was the greatest maritime nation in the world and the one with which Rome had the longest struggle. So it goes without saying that the hierarchy of Rome knew that the Irish church of Iessa Christa, which is Jesus Christ, Iessa Christ, had established Christianity or sun worship on the western continent. This knowledge must have been confirmed by the Irish priests who were brought into the Roman church organization at the time and the suppression of the Irish church. So when the project of the western voyage was first purposed, it was looked upon with ill favor by the church fathers because they considered it an epitome and the time inauspicious. They feared that the voyage would lead to the discovery and revelation of facts before the whole world which would be damaging to the church. Therefore, they tried to dissuade Columbus under various pretexts and discouragements to give up the idea and in every manner possible by argument, ridicule, and false logic to convince him that he held erroneous ideas concerning the shape of the earth. By a display of superior learning, they sought to convince him that his theory and beliefs were alike fallacious. In the light of what transpired, it seemed that those men, when they found their way, could not dissuade Columbus from his purpose, parried for delay, and, in the meantime, they formulated a plan of policy by which they could prevent intelligence of any damaging facts which might be discovered from the spreading abroad. It was only after this decision was made what we believe that enough information about the western continent and the great wealth that existed there was made known privily to Ferdinand and Isabella and was in this information which was decided her to sell her jewels 
and at the very least, available assets to finance the expedition. Considering the war in which the royal pair were engaged and the sacrifices which they had already made to advance the interests of the church, it is not reasonable to suppose that the priest would have encouraged or advised her to part with her jewels, her last penny, to back the wild and foolish proposition, as they had hitherto held to be. But they now gave both her and the king assurances that the outcome of the voyage was certainly beyond merely the ordinary hazards of the sea. In view of the knowledge in our possession, in fact, may be stated here that one of no little importance in this connection, and that the companion of Columbus on this voyage is listed in the rolls as William the Irishman from Dublin. In the view of the importance in which attached to this enterprise and was openly stacked upon it his royal patron and the secretly expected of it of the church fathers, it is but natural to suppose that the men of the best nautical skill and knowledge were secured to assist Columbus. Another little aside here. What, what, she just, what they just said there is that on the voyage and some of the, um, the logs, you know, one of the people that they had there as a navigator was uh, an Irishman from Dublin. So saying that he knew the way across the ocean. He knew the way across the sea. And then I'll also say, totally side note, go read the book by Scott Walter, which is spelled W-O-L-T-E-R, I believe, Scott Walter. It's called The Hooked X. And it's about the Kensington runestone that exists and was found in Kensington, Pennsylvania, which um, has runic writing on it from Gotland. Much, much older, the style of writing is much older than than the voyage of Columbus. It's been carbon dated and stuff. So basically it just proves that there were um, Europeans here in North America hundreds of years, if not thousands of years before Columbus. Okay, so moving on. So it is only fair to assume that this person was a sea wise in the knowledge of the Irish mariners who were formerly the unrivaled sea voyagers of the world from time out of mind. Their nearest competitors but far inferior in range, being the Norse of the latter day. The Irishman William may have previously made such a voyage himself, which might account for his being with the Columbus on the voyage. If such was the case, no record of it would have been allowed to exist. The systematic suppression of facts, which is almost beyond belief of the history of the Irish achievements, is most shameless and barefaced. Carried on by agencies already mentioned, it is the plainest fact that Ireland's history has been written by her enemies. However, it is important to note that an Irishman was one of the personnel on that voyage. He was of the race of seamen who made voyages across the Western Ocean and had a constant intercourse with the people of the American continent from the time of the Bronze Age. See Atlantis book, Bronze Age in Europe, page 237. It is a fair conjecture to say that the least that he brought some particular and special knowledge to Columbus and was familiar with the seafaring traditions of his race. The church fathers in all essential practicality ruled the Spanish kingdom and were the closest advisors of the king and queen. Those shrewd men, crafty strategists with the world perspective of their organization knew of the Irish church colonizations on the opposite side of the Atlantic and that it was from there that the priests of the Irish church obtained the gold and silver for their church services and for the ornaments of their symbolic monuments, pyramids, temples, towers, obelisks, and dolans. Ireland itself, so far as known, never yielded more than a small amount of those metals, and they were dedicated to the use of the sun worship. The policy decided upon, judging by what actually occurred, was to place a close censorship upon the voyage. The same policy was applied subsequent voyages, and along we find the priests accompanying every voyage and in the van of every expedition. He was there to observe everything discovered and to bring back a report of the superiors, and more especially to take note on the religious state and conditions which were found and existing in the western land. He was there also for the purpose of mutilating and destroying whatever evidence might be found that would be injurious or damaging to the claims of the Roman Church. This evidence was found in abundance. 
everywhere as well as can be shown. All things considered, there is no other hypothesis but this outstanding fact upon which to account for the sack and ruins of temples and altars, monuments and symbols, as well as the destructions of cities, coupled with the awful killings and massacres committed by the Spaniards, dominated by the priests, upon highly civilized, peaceable, and practically unarmed people. They received the Spanish as friends, even as the traditional fair gods, bearded white men, the Irish Magi returning to them, as was expected and promised. They received them with open hospitality and welcome. The recompense they received in turn was frightful and savage. They were slaughtered with the result. In a few short years, the population was reduced in numbers, that their leaders killed off, their civilization destroyed, and their temples and religious institutions ruined. This happened not only in Mexico, but also in Yucatan and in Peru. It is my purpose to go into the phase of Spanish policy extensively here, much less to treat and the enslavement of natives, but only to show that underlying motive was back of such action on the part of the Spaniards. This will be seen by what the priests discovered. They found here, as was expected, an abundance of proof of Irish or Aryan connection with the religious institutions of Mexico, Peru, and elsewhere on this American continent. They were practically in the same boat North and South America. It was the Irish sun worship or Christianity which prevailed among the civilized inhabitants of both continents. The name Cusco, the capital of Peru, the seat of the sun worship in South America, testifies to their establishing a colony there, for Cusco is an Irish name of the sun god from Cies, spelled C-A-I-S, meaning an I, and haste, a twist or a turn, or a whirling, a stream, love, virility, of the sun in spring. The sun god, Kazga, is still worshipped to this day, not only in Ireland, but throughout the entire Christian world on Domhegnig Kazga, which is Easter Sunday, the day of the risen sun in springtime. The city of Cusco was the seat of the Enca or Inca, I-N-C-A, or head of the sun worship in the southern continent. These facts alone, even in the absence of other direct positive and indisputable proof, should have no doubt whatever as to who discovered and civilized ancient America. I will briefly mention some only of the rites and customs which the Spanish priests found here in the religious worship of the people. They found, among other things, the worship of the Holy Virgin Mother and Child. She was worshipped as the Mother God, the, Anu, the Annunciation, and that she was the Mother of the Savior was made to her by an angel, and the child became the crucified Savior who died on the cross. This Savior fasted for 40 days on a mountain and was tempted by Satan, the same as Iessa, or Jesus. They found here the sacrament of the Eucharist and communion. They also found the institution of prayer, confession, belief in the forgiveness of sin, fasting, and the doing of penance. They found the presence of baptism, where an infant was baptized in water and the sign of the cross. This water washed away the sin and the child was born anew. They found the Irish institution of religious houses, both the virgin woman who dedicated their lives to the service of God and for men who led a chaste and pure life. They found the cross and the crucifix held in great veneration everywhere in Mexico, Yucatan, and Peru. In brief, I may say that they found in practice, a practice here in America about all of which religious rites were brought here by the ancient priests of the Irish Church of Iessa and which were incidental with what is now called the Roman Catholic Christianity. They formulated this religion originally and spread it around the world to peoples who were capable of receiving it. It is not surprising at all. During a period of a thousand years, it became affected with some slight changes. It would be strange if it did not. The time has affected change in all religions. Here is what the Reverend J.P. Lundy says of the rite of baptism and the manner in which it was given. American priests were found in Mexico beyond Darien baptizing boys and girls a year old in the temples at the cross, pouring water upon them from a small pitcher. In South America, the natives took baths in a religious rite 
to cleanse away the sin and were very natural. But for all remarkable, the thing about it is that the Irish name of those baths had survived for thousands of years and have come down to us to confront and refute those despicable, despicable frauds who have stolen the fruits of the great Irish apostles who were the first to preach the gospel or the word, the whole word, to the whole world. Those baths were called Opakuna, Opakuna, or the bath of sins. That is the bath for cleansing off sins. The Irish word for sin is Paka, and Pakuna means the sin. These facts leave no room for doubt as to whom we owe the civilization of Mexico, Yucatan, and Peru, and elsewhere on this American continent. The Spanish priests, the Reverend Father Acosta, in speaking of the religious rites and customs of the natives, says, The Indians had an infinite number of other ceremonies and customs in which resembled the law of Moses, and some of these which the Moors use, and some approaching near the law of the gospel and the baths of Apucuna, as they call them. They did wash themselves in water to cleanse themselves from sin. Bible Myths, page 323.